I hear it all the time. I don't understand what the Bible means. Well, most of those people don't know what the Bible means because they don't know what the Bible says. We're going to change that today. Get ready to learn all about the big O of Bible stuff. Hey guys, welcome to 30 on Thursdays, the online resource of the Root Church of Tampa Bay. Pastor David here with you, and I gotta say, this week's episode reminds me of that sage advice that my grandmother used to give. Be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. Okay, maybe that's more of a warning. But anyway, in our last episode, we talked about all of the benefits of personal Bible study. And by personal Bible study, I mean you and God's Word and nothing or no one else. No book by Francis Chan or Priscilla Shire or David R. Smith. No sermon from your favorite online preacher. Just you, the Bible, and time, right? Well, somewhere in there, I made mention of maybe doing a special episode that focused on the tried and true Bible study methods that I use in my own life. And you guys chimed in loud and clear through social media asking for more on that subject. So that's what we're going to focus on in this week's episode of 30 on Thursdays. But again, like my grandma said, be careful what you ask for. Now, I'm going to give you a handful of simple tips that have helped me for years and years and years. But I'm going to focus on one of them much more than all of the others. In fact, I'm basically going to just like mention five tips, but hammer on a sixth one, okay? All, all of them are important, but the one that we're going to be like zeroing in on today is arguably the most important. I, I call it the big O of Bible study. If you don't get the big O right, there's a chance that everything after it could be skewed. And because we're talking about God's word, we cannot afford that. Okay, guys? Listen, we're going to be moving fast. And there's going to be a practice session included in this week's episode. So let's just get to it. Here are my go-to tips for pulling off a highly effective personal Bible study. You ready? Tip number one, disconnect from the world. Every single time we lead mission teams to South Africa, we get a consistent piece of feedback that goes something like this. My gosh, this week was amazing. Like I heard God speak so clearly. And you know why? It's because God speaks more clearly in Africa than he does here in America, right? Of course not. God speaks clearly regardless of the continent. But in Africa, their smartphones don't work. Uh, there's no place to plug in their laptop. And Netflix, well, it's just not an option. Guys, the very first thing I'd tell you to do when you study God's word is to ruthlessly eliminate every distraction around you. Then put down your phone, put it in another room, put it on silent even, okay? Turn off the TV, um, close down the laptop, make sure the kids have gone somewhere and have something to do to keep them busy while you spend time with Jesus. Basically, what you want to do here is what David said to do in Psalm 37 verse 7. He wrote, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. That whole be still part is tough for us, right? But you got to get it right if you want to hear from the Lord. So disconnect from the world around you so you can connect with God. All right? So let's move on to tip number two. Pray for the Spirit's guidance. Now listen, guys. According to Jesus, one of the Holy Spirit's job descriptions is to teach us all things and bring our remembrance to everything Jesus taught. You can read more about that for yourself in John chapter 14. But knowing that, before I jump into my study time, I like to pause and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me into whatever it is Jesus wants me to know. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks with the authority of God because, well, you know, he is God. Literally, while I'm opening my Bible, I turn my attention to the Holy Spirit for a few moments and I ask for his help, his leadership, his illumination, okay? And you should do the same. Speaking of opening my Bible, let's move straight into tip number three. Move through the Bible orderly. I guess you could like grab your Bible, flip it open all willy-nilly, and God will still speak volumes, okay? I just don't recommend this strategy. I don't suggest you bounce around through God's word without any sense of order. Move through the Bible kind of in a logical fashion by, you know, starting at the beginning of a particular book and making your way through it until you're done. 
I mean, if you just try jumping around, like if you jump into the middle of Isaiah or Job, <laughs> dude, you're, you're going to be cooked, okay? I suggest practicing on a few of the short books of the Bible just to get into a little bit of a groove. I mean, perhaps like Colossians or Philippians in the New Testament or, or Jonah, Ruth, Esther in the Old Testament. These are short stories, but powerful stories. Just move through them from start to finish. But what do you do with those stories? I mean, what do you do with the verses in front of you? Well, um, it's time for tip number four, or as I call it, the big O of Bible study. And here's the way I'll put it. Make observations from Scripture. Guys, observation is the big O of Bible study. If you attend the Root Church, then you hear me continually talk about the black ink on the white page, right? The black ink on the white page. And I mean that in the most literal of senses. I'm talking about the words that are printed on the pages of your Bible. Uh, what does the Bible actually say? I didn't ask for your feelings. I didn't ask for your opinions. I'm not even asking you to tell me what the Bible means, at, at least not at this point. I'm simply asking you, what does the Bible say? Can you make key observations about the passage that you just read? Look, let's say you, you read a story from the Old Testament. Uh, and, and let's pick a, let's pick a really well-known one. How about like David and Goliath from, uh, from 1 Samuel 17? Okay, if you read that story, it's the whole chapter, can you answer those newspaper questions that you learned about in the fourth grade? You know, who, what, where, when, why, and how? I mean, can you tell me where the fight actually took place? Can you tell me about the topography of the land around David? Can you tell me how many people David even fought that day? Hint, it wasn't just one. And can you even tell me why David was at the battlefield that day? You see, all those questions are answered point blank right there in the story. And I believe that the answers to those questions really help fashion the lesson that God wants us to learn from this ancient story. Now, guys, we're going to circle back to the big O in just a moment. But let me tell you what you do with all those details that you observe from God's word, which is tip number five. I told you we're going to be moving fast. Tip number five, let observation drive interpretation. Guys, it's as simple as it sounds. I, I can't tell you, though, how many grown men and women I've met who jump the gun, get things out of order, and try to interpret the Bible without first studying the Bible. The, the, the truth is, you can't know what the Bible means until you know what the Bible says. And if you try to do interpretation before observation, you're most likely going to misunderstand what the Bible means. Look, it was just... Play it out like this. Imagine for a moment that you're a homicide detective, okay? I know, grim, right? And you get a dispatch that notifies you of a murder. You jump in your car, hit the lights, race towards the scene of the crime. Let me ask you an important question. Are you putting together a list of suspects while you drive to the crime scene? I sure hope not. I mean, unless you're the luckiest cop in the world, you're going to arrest about a million innocent people before you get to the real bad guy, right? You see, as a detective, you know that you have to look for clues. You have to gather evidence. You, you have to ask some hard questions. And then when you get everything put in front of you, you start looking for a suspect that fits the facts. Well, it's the same way with Bible study. Only after you've made your observations can you begin to make your interpretations. Your observations, what the Bible says, will always lead to interpretation, what the Bible means, okay? And now that you know what the Bible means... There's just one last step, which I call tip number six. And it's this, live what you learn. That's it. I mean, you must apply God's word to your life. If God speaks to you, write it down and live it out. John 14, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. In the same chapter later, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my word. I mean, guys, the entire point here of Bible study is obedience, right? If you want to do what God said, you first got to know what God said. Pastor Rick Warren is fond of saying this. Interpretation without application is abortion. In other words, if you study the Bible but don't apply what you learn, the goal has been aborted. It's been killed. If you want to study God's word just to get smarter or to look more spiritual or to help you win arguments, then you've missed God's entire point entirely. God wants you to study his word so you can live more like his son, Jesus. You can do that by living out what you learn. Well, all right. Um, that's my super quick tutorial of Bible study tips. 
But I want us to circle back to the big O because I promised you guys a practice session in this episode. And yeah, that means we're actually going to practice making observation from a passage of scripture. Now, as I get started, I want to give credit where credit is due, okay? All the way back in seminary, Dr. Garwood Anderson introduced us to something called the inductive Bible study method in his class on the Gospel of Mark. Now, Woody ran a simple class. There were no quizzes, no tests, not even a final exam. Uh, on the first day of the class, he gave each of us about a 14 or 15 page print off that had a single staple in the upper left hand corner. It was the Gospel of Mark in double space format without any indentations, chapter notations, verse notations, headings, footnotes, nothing. If Mark didn't write it, Woody didn't include it. Okay? And he told us this is how his class was going to operate. Each week we would be assigned like a certain chunk of scripture to read to reread and read again so that we could make significant observations about the passage and bring them back to class the following week. That was it. That was our homework. Our assignments were due at the beginning of the class and then we just sit around for two hours during the class and talk as a group about all the meaningful observations we found in God's Word. Now guys, he taught us to look very closely at things like what you see on the screen in front of you. He said, be watching for repeated words or characters, cause and effect, you know, references to other scriptures, commands, you know, timelines, uh, lists locations, actions, like, like you see all of these things right here in front of you, that last one, you know, details and then, and then questions, questions that you raise as you study the passage, okay? Now, guys, I have used this concept in my own personal Bible study and in my preaching ever since I learned it. And, and I got to say, um, I like to keep it old school, okay? When I do Bible study, I don't open a Word document. I don't use my software. I, I don't even want my laptop or my phone around because invariably, I'll get an email or a text message that has to be handled right away and it'll distract me from the crucial task at hand, which is focusing on God's Word and identifying exactly what it says so that I can understand exactly what what it means. So here's what that looks like. I grab my black Bible, my blue pen, and my white pad, and I get someplace quiet and start scribbling. I give each verse its own page, and I start burning through the passage verse by verse by verse. Now, shorter verses might only yield like four or five observations, but a longer verse might have as many as 15 or 16 observations, along with three or four nagging questions. Now, while I'm studying, I try to do two basic things, okay? Number one, I write down everything I see in God's Word, big or small. And number two, I keep track of the questions that I raise in my own heart and my head as I study, okay? Now, we're going to practice this right here and right now. I'll give you some instructions and then let you hit the pause button for as long as it takes. And when you're ready to resume the episode, we can compare notes. You ready? Here we go. Grab your Bible. Flip over to Matthew chapter 4. We'll use the well-known passage of scripture that outlines the temptation of Christ that's found in verses 1 through 11. Okay? Now, I want you to work verse by verse, writing down as many observations as you can using the tools we just talked about. Okay? And do not, I repeat, do not start trying to interpret anything yet. I just want you writing down as many observations as you can make right there from the verses, okay? Here, I'll get you started with a couple of examples, all right? Watch this. Number one, if you're familiar with the story, you'll see that the devil is willing to use God's word out of context to lead us astray. Number two, uh, in each of Jesus' responses, he quotes Deuteronomy. I find that highly interesting, okay? Now, if you're watching this episode as a family, I encourage you to work together on this little project. I, I don't want to freak you out, but I'll just tell you, I made a total of like 97 observations from these verses and wrote down like 16 separate questions that were raised by the Holy Spirit as I was grinding along. I don't know if this is scary or exciting to you, but, but I guarantee you I missed some, okay? It's the Word of God. Like, there's always more to see, okay? So listen, guys, you got the game plan. Here we go. Hit pause, work through those verses looking for significant observations, and then restart the video when you're done so we can compare notes at the end. You ready? Have fun. So how'd you do, guys? I'd love to compare notes with you for just a moment. Uh, here are some of the most significant observations I made from the passage, like in addition to those other two we just talked about. Um, number one, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted. 
That's interesting, okay? Number two, 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, how many times is 40 days and 40 nights mentioned in the Bible? I don't think that's there accidentally. Uh, number three, Jesus only used Satan's name once, and Satan never used Jesus' name. That is probably the biggest one. And speaking of Satan, number four, he tried to use God's word against Jesus. Now, I also wrote down some questions like, is there a reason that the angels didn't show up until after Jesus had overcome the devil? Why did Jesus quote from Deuteronomy each and every single time he was tempted? Help me out here, guys, will you? Just take a moment and drop your three or four most significant observations in the comment section below. And while you're at it, put in there some of those burning questions that you were raised as well. I mean, I would love to see what it is that you're seeing because you probably found something that I missed, all right? Now, guys... I know I threw a lot at you in this week's episode, so let me just kind of wrap up with some very simple but very encouraging news, okay? Let's start here. Like everything else in life, you will get better at this with practice. Just start small and keep at it. Number two, the more time you're willing to wrestle with God's word, the more clearly you're going to hear God speak. I never make my best observations in the first five minutes. I always make my best observations 30, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour into my study. But if you're prepared to make the investment of time, God is definitely going to bless you with his voice. Number three, getting the answers to your questions can change your life. If you were confronted by two or three questions in this passage, man, I encourage you to chase down those answers. If you found 15, hunt, search, explore, and seek until you get to the bottom of the issue. Because the Holy Spirit didn't ask your heart those questions for no reason. He wants you to find something, okay, guys? So listen, the Root Church would love to help you find those answers. We say we do two things at our church. Number one, we teach God's word clearly. And number two, we serve our community weekly. If you'd like to get some clear answers to life or faith or just about anything else, uh, join us for worship any Saturday at 5 p.m. We meet in the university area at 2121 East 131st Avenue. Our church is a great group of people who will do anything we can to help you understand and obey God's word. Now, obviously, we'd encourage you to, you know, keep working with us through these episodes of 30 on Thursdays. And if you know someone that would benefit from these resources, by all means, please share the episodes with them. And hopefully we can connect in the comment sections below or better yet at church this coming weekend. Either way, we look forward to seeing you right back here for our very next episode of 30 on Thursdays. Take care.